This is the Saskine kiln uh, that was built about four years ago in Sedaira, Portugal. Sedaira, the home for creativity, is a village in the center of Portugal, which was built and developed by artists who came to an abandoned schist village, schist being the kinds of buildings you see in the background there with these layers of stone. And they built this entire village or re refurbished it. It was kind of in ruin um, and started remodeling houses with the idea of creating a both a tourist destination and a retreat for artists. Uh, there are many artists who come here to teach and many artists who come here as a residency and many artists who come here or writers come to uh, take a quiet retreat in nature. So there is a program for wood firing and this is the kiln at the heart of that program, the Saskine Smokeless Kiln. And you can read all about the construction and design of this kiln in chapter four of Japanese wood-fired ceramics. But what I want to do today is talk about how you approach a kiln like this and think about it for your own plans to fire and how would you think through um, how you want to design the kiln load and how you want to think about the firing. So that's what this presentation is about. Here's a more frontal view, and you can see that there's um, uh, kind of three segments of this kiln design. There's the firebox, and significantly I'm pointing out underneath the firebox because you can actually load there, and I'll talk more about that. And then there's the traditional place for loading, the wear chamber, right in the center. That's where all the work goes. That's the wear chamber. And then finally, um, the chimney chamber here is a very unique aspect of this design. Most kilns do not uh, put something like this in, but under as the kiln transitions to the chimney, the bottom part of the chimney is made larger than necessary and it becomes a loading chamber and that's why you see the bricks in front as a door that you can open and close to load in that area. So here's a diagram of the kiln, and once again, you can see, in this case, this is uh, viewed, you can see the front, uh, the, the stoking hole door right here. You can see the wear chamber here, and the, um, this is actually a back view of the kiln because the door to the chimney chamber is on the other side of this view. So, but there's so many ways to think about loading a wood kiln, and I wanted to talk to you about the, the central principles that you might want to consider. And the first is you consider the actual approach, very economical. Where am I going to put the pots? How do the pots go in, the sculpture, whatever I'm loading? What's the way that I do that? And, and here is a very straightforward economic uh, way of doing it. And um, when we start talking about the path of the flame, you'll get an understanding of this dark line in the middle here is called the bag wall. And I'll talk to you more about that function in just a minute. But this is a standard way of thinking about, okay, here's this is unusual that you put things in underneath the, um, the firebox and you can actually load things in the flue passage into the wear chamber as long as you're, not, you're careful not to choke it. You have to keep a lot of open space. But then you want to consider the passage of the flame through this kiln. And here you can see what the purpose of the bag wall is, because you can see here the flame uh, is actually, this is a very special design. And because of the tall chimney over here, this creates a very strong draft. So when you build a fire on the top of the firebox grate here, the, the, the flame, the, the ash, the heat is all pulled down and through the kiln and and the reason you know heat he does tend to want to rise but this bag wall is here because if it weren't the flame would just go straight across the bottom and the top would not get get much effect at all it would go straight across the bottom but in this case what's happening is because of the bag wall it forces the flame up and then back down again so it addresses pots at the top it gets it does a good job of getting uh, in contact with uh, most of the pots here. And so the the thinking in one way is that anything that's in f between the firebox and the bag wall, this is going to get the heaviest ash. And in, in this zone here, it's going to get lots of embers. And then back here, it's going to get heat. And there's a side stoking area, which would allow it to get some, some embers, uh, maybe increase the ash. 
Um, but this is going to be much quieter in terms of exposure to ash and uh, and um, flame than the f than the front. So here's another view of that centralized bag wall. And primarily here, because another consideration you have is where do I want to introduce fuel? Because wherever you introduce fuel, you intensify the ash effects. You intensify an effect called conge, um, which is the word that refers to when uh, embers get, uh, get uh, saturated with uh, glass and, and stuck to the side of your pot. Um, it's the same word in Japanese for the rice that sticks in the bottom of the rice cooker. So konge. And then, um, so everywhere you can in, put a side stoke uh, in, your, in your kiln design, anytime you can make a space in the loading and in the kiln itself to put a hole that you can throw wood in, um, that's going to um, increase the number of places where the pottery is in proximity, indeed in contact with the burning fuel. So in this design, you have the firebox here, which is shown as, as, as cooled down and dormant because they've moved on to side stoking. And then you have this um, area here, which is the, um, it's the place for um, uh, the first side stoke, and it's primary. Everything here is getting inundated with ash and, to some extent, embers. And then this function would to be buried in, um, buried in embers, uh, and that would get more um, contact in this front shelf area. And it also is makes it potential for an effect called zangari. Zangari is um, a special kind of reduction effect. Uh, that happens when embers surround, bury a piece after it has been heated up enough to have ash on it. So that is a possibility um, to do this, um, but it's also possible to because it's so much so directly in contact with all the ash and ember and flame. You you could choose to um, forego this uh, side stoke, and then you have this side stoke here, which I think is pretty important because. Oh, the flame and the heat, uh, the ash is blocked by the bag wall. Putting it here is um, putting a side stoke at that point uh, gives you the opportunity to add embers and, and, and to add fuel to put ash and, and uh, flame and, and embers in this area as well. So you have some choices uh, to, to consider in your loading design. Now here's here's the plan that I'm making for a loading of this kiln. And what I'm emphasizing in here is um, for educational purposes is the kinds of effect, effects we can expect. And that's really, you'll notice I go from A to M. That's a lot of different uh, Johan zones or wood firing effect zones. And I'm, I'm emphasizing here the design of this kiln is such that it really wants to encourage a variety of effects. It's not a unified style firing. It's really wildly uh, varied in the kinds of effects that you can get. So here we're going to go to the, into this in much greater detail, but you can see we have, uh, I'll just review here, A is up against the outer wall and it's a special area where we can put um, pieces that have already been cone, uh, 10 fired in, in a gas kiln, already glaze fired. And then B is in underneath the firebox still, and um, and is as an area for uh, intense uh, burying and embers and getting uh, some erosion. As is C, and uh, D. Uh, C is inside the passageways from the firebox to the main chamber, and you want to be very careful not to put too much in there if you block. Um, the passage of air from one to the X in the flame, you can basically choke up the entire firing. And then D here is the ground space. Um, that's the ground area. And that is, um, that's the floor right in front of the firebox. And, and you see where it says free fire zone. There's a wedge here that you never want to put anything in because it will prevent the flame from moving through the kiln. So you keep that space open. And then you have, um, E is the, the first shelves um, where everything is um, stacked uh, that is going to get the heaviest ash impingement of 
of all the work that's on shelves. And uh, as you go higher, you still get ash, you still get flame, but you get less with the distance from the original wood fuel source. And then G is a special area because um, the bag wall suppresses the flame from, the flame tends to want to go up this way, and so does the heat, and so does the ash. So this is a very much quieter zone than you might expect from being right in front of the of the fire. And then you get to H, and H is in part of that passage of the flame that you saw, that, that it gets a really, uh, gets some nice ash, but it's a good place for glazes, and for glazes especially that, that you want to augment with uh, natural ash deposits. Um, then we get, we get into I. I is a side stoke area, so I is going to be a place where you can load pots down at the bottom of this uh, little firebox, and that is where um, you can put a few few small pieces that will get uh, knocked around and um, definitely gets usually turns very smoky black and not a heavy ash buildup in that case. And then J once again is uh, it's a milder version of E in that it, it's getting a lot of uh, uh, access to wood and ash, but not nearly as much as E that's uh, there from the beginning of firing. Uh, K is the the least ash impinged area of the whole kiln and is an excellent place for glaze and in particular it's a fabulous place for temaku. Temaku uh, influence with ash which we call oni temaku is a, uh, a really subtle and powerful, I don't know if subtle but it gets some beautiful range of effects. L uh, it's kind of a secret chamber. It's a little, it's the flue that goes from the wear chamber into the chimney. And you can put like sake cup sized things in there, really small little sculptures or sake cups. You can't put big things. If you choke that up, you have no firing. You will, you know, and you can't just go, oh, I'll take that out. Because once it's, you know, you load the kiln, you put everything in, and then you brick up the walls. And so it would, you'd have to do it all over. It'd be a day's work to take that little sock if it got too big. Take that out. And then M is the chimney has a chamber. At the base of the chimney, there's actually a chamber. And that's going to get mostly flame or fire uh, kind of coloring. It's a uh, very um, hero dominant. It, it allows less for ash and more for, for the gases, the, the, um, the gases to color the wear. So that's the M area. So that, I've gone over what this kiln zones, all the different zones are, and now I'm going to show you, we're going to go over that in greater detail in two different ways. So we're going to go from there. And so these are some things that you want to think about as we're going through this, and you can see the direct, you want to think about, okay, where is the most direct exposure to flame going to be? And, and you can see it's A, B, C, D, that's exposure to flame or to embers, to embers, A, B, C, D, and then I and J. That's where the most exposures to embers. You can think about the potential for erosion, and erosion is going to happen in B, C, and D. Um, best positions for glaze zones, F, uh, G, H, K, and L. L, with a, L might be a good place to experiment with a Shino. Best area for hero flame effects. Um, again, that's where that has to be where there's less ash, um, and uh, so when there's less ash, then you can see the the registration of the gases carried in the flame. They're the same chemicals that are in the ash, but they've volatized and they're they're now moving through the kiln as a gas. And so in order for them to have uh, to show up, you need a little kind of a sweating of ash, just a little glimmer of ash melt on the surface, and then no more. If you have heavy ash, you won't see any hero. So you have, um, uh, you have uh, that would happen more in the backside of F, H, and K, uh, possibly L. Um, best, oh, I'm sorry, no, I'm F, I want to say F, G, H, K, L, and M are the hero zones. The hero zones. That's a good plan. Best placement for thick work. Now, in some areas in this kiln, uh, it's best to have thick work because it's going to erode and the clay is going to get eaten away, and that's in B, C, and D areas. That's where erosion happens in this kind of kiln. 
And then areas you want to really pay attention to keep uh, free, you don't want to choke up under the firebox, but especially not in the flu area. And then D, you can put place things on the floor uh, low. You don't want to exceed like 33 uh, centimeters, uh, about a foot. And then, um, and then there's a kind of wedge shape that goes above that that you don't put anything in. It's kind of the, the pyramid of death there. That you don't want to... Um, if you put things in there, you'll block the flame and uh, kind of choke up the firing. Um, so that area is kept free. Um, the flu L, again, just like the flu C, you want to keep that area relatively open and free. And along the bag wall of the back chamber, back here, you don't want to put the shelves right against the bag wall. You want to let flame be encouraged to come down the back side as well. So, and then all around the, the shelves in the chimney chamber here, all around this area, you do need to have um, a space again so you don't choke the firing. So let's talk about the bag wall placement. We talked about what a bag wall is, and you saw by the way the flame moved what it does. So on the left, you have um, a bag wall uh, towards the back, um, and in, in, in towards the back of the of the wear chamber, um, the three sides there are three side stokes in this particular design, which is kind of interesting. Um, but when you have the bag wall that far back, what you're saying is I want more ash and less zones for glazing and more zones for ash, um, for natural ash and in uh, and, and vapors and such. But then if you look on the right. Um, you'll see uh, the bag wall is way towards the front. And this is the opposite. This is saying, okay, except for some zones in the very front here, in like basically A through D, I'm going to have heavy ash and ember, but then it's over. I want, I want this to be a glaze, kiln firing, and I want all these things to have to, to be uh, less uh, impinged on by the ash and the flame. So that's what this design does for you. So now we go back to the bag wall being in the center, and then there's a decision to be made here, which is really interesting. You can see on the left, what we have is we have um, the shelves uh, built right over what is the firebox here. This is the side stoke firebox is right here. And you can see these shelves uh, are stacked right over the top of it. And then on the other side, what you can see is the space over between the bag wall and the back stack is open. There is no shelf spanning that. And that has the advantage of the flame coming over here and then being pulled, because all the flame is always going towards the flue. So it would be pulled down here this way, and it would get more, it would penetrate more of the back stack, which would be kind of uh, an advantage. So here again, there's the bag wall, and you can see uh, the arrows are pointing both to the bag wall and to the covering shelves. And here is again the bag wall, and here's the gap that's open uh, instead of shelves. So that's what I'm speaking about as something to consider. So once again now, we have this, this beautifully drawn um, diagram that I've created uh, to emphasize all these different zones of effects. And the, oftentimes you'll get amazing pieces in between because you'll get a range of effects. You'll get what would happen in E and what will happen in G on a piece. You might get um, you know, the difference between J and K or F and H. The, you can get some pieces that are um, have even more range of effects across the piece. So those are possibilities. Um, uh, so we're gonna now we're gonna actually see some examples of um, what what this looks like. But so you can see these are the chambers. With the, again, breaking it down to the three chambers, we have the firebox, we have the um, wear chamber in the middle, and then we have the chimney. So let's just look at the under the firebox to begin with. Below the firebox, under A, that section, that against that outer wall of the firebox, that's really, it doesn't get as hot as, as the middle and the end of the firebox. So um, what happens there is you can uh, take advantage of that space to load things that have already been high-fired 
um, with a glaze. And then what you're getting is you're getting it hopefully hot enough as the embers start to fall down, it gets hopefully hot enough that the glaze starts to remelt. And then those embers surround it and cause lots of microclimates of reduction and oxidation. And that makes a real change in, in glaze color. And you'll see, I'll show you examples of that. Then B, uh, what happens is a, a pile of ember, should be able to put that in there, but a pile of ember builds up down here and crosses over these pieces. And what you'll see here is you'll see um, a, an angle across the piece of uh, conge, of ember build up. And then you'll get very ashy and sometimes erosion on the top of the piece here and almost bisque temperatures down here. Same will happen here except for the, the ember pile tends to go lower and do an angle of ember across. And I'll show you examples of these. And that's in C. And of course, B and C are very, very intense environments because the flame is coming down from the top and sweeping by this. Everything that happens in that kiln ha goes by these pieces. So it often leads to erosion and I'll show you examples of that. Uh, C, again, um, very intense erosion effects. Um, everything that is ends up above the uh, sl slope of embers gets um, erosion and lots of, of natural ash deposits. And then everything below gets embers attached to it and gets um, uh, and can be insulated and turn more bisque. Um, so now we're moving on to the wear chamber. And when we look inside, there's lots of things. And so we have uh, actually two parts of the wear chamber, so much to talk about. On the floor, um, that's going to be more of an extension of very intense ash. Less, you'll get still a little bit of the sloping in of the embers from the firebox. Um, so you get some angled conge, and you'll get um, uh, some wonderful uh, kinds of uh, just beautiful ash effects, very heavy ash. You have to, these pieces that are in C and D need to be stilted with actual clay because if you were to use a uh, wood ash, I'm sorry, if you were to use um, our wadding mix, that mix would end up um, saturating with ash and becoming just a lump of glass stuck to your piece. So s sometimes we use tripods made of clay to over, to, um, save ourselves from that problem. Um, e is, as you can see, the, the ash comes in from the, the, the ash and the flame and the heat comes in from the firebox and E gets, is this shelving area that gets the brunt of that. And all along the front of E and F, you'll see um, some great quality of ash, natural ash deposit. You can also, when you get up to F, you can start putting in some glazes that do well with a heavy ash impingement, such as a Shino or the Oribe glaze. Um, temaku up at that front tends to disappear into a kind of a blue surface. Um, and then, then what you'll see here is that the G, um, in the G zone, um, uh, that area is actually, um, because the bag wall is pushing the flame up, it's actually pushing the ash and flame away from this area. So this is a good area for glazes. Um, to mitigate some of the loss of, of natural ash effect. So let's go on and see the other areas that we have here. We have H, and again, H is kind of E, F, and, and H are this kind of continuum of, of, of a reducing, so, so heavy shizenyu, still pretty heavy shizenyu, that's, that's the natural ash glaze deposit, um, but lessening and lessening, and then when you get to H, um, it's, it starts to be more hero um, than it does to be, um, so hero is the flame effects, that's the volatized materials in the, in the flame. Um, the ash materials go gaseous and that gives you hero effects. And the same with K, K is an excellent um, place for, um, K is an excellent place for having um, glazed pieces. And that's the where Temeku thrives and becomes this Oni Temeku. And I'm going to show you examples of this, I promise. And then finally, we'll look at a I and J. It's not, there's still a few more places to go, but I is a little tiny side stoke firebox. And you can put pieces right down at the bottom of there. They mostly turn a kind of dark, reduced um, uh, black. 
with some color on the part that faces down. And then with J, it's kind of a mini re recreation of E. You get some ember contact, you get a lot of knocking around by stoked wood if you're not careful, and you can get some, um, some heavy ash there, but not nearly as heavy as what you get in E and F. So here's the chimney area, and we have two more areas to discuss. The flue between the chamber and the chimney, that passageway. We can put really small pieces. We do not want to block anything. So we put small pieces, and those can sometimes get some beautiful effects, because literally everything that goes through the kiln ends up going through there. And so you can get some real concentration of ash, and it can be quite beautiful. Sometimes a, a chino makes it... Um, in that spot will make will become very um, have some very unique effects in color, um, and then the uh, the chimney chamber that we've talked about that's quite unique to this design. That's where you'll end up with mostly the gases influencing coloring your pieces. So now we're going to go through these effects one by one, starting with A. That's the unique uh, refiring technique where you put uh, already fired pieces, um, things that have glaze on them. This was a piece that had my uh, Lancet's Oribe glaze. You can see that it turned kind of a turquoise blue, and, um, and it's been fired upside down, which gives you those gravity-defying drips. And um, it is, um, it's been fired... Uh, in that zone of the um, under the firebox, but be, it's put next to the bag wall to the to the back side up against the not next to the bag wall the back wall the outside wall of the firebox because that's the lowest temperature. Here's another example of something um, again the same glaze uh, design some clear and some lancets oribe, and you can see the oribe is gone. In red in some places and blue in others. Here's another. This is a Shino that's been uh, fired in that position. And here it is uh, from the inside where you can see the effect of the um, seashells. These are scallop shells that are been, it's been posted on. So now we're getting into the section B, which is still in the firebox, not quite... Um, but not quite to the flu, but it's right by the flu. And so you can see um, there's a couple of things that happen. One is this is erosion. What's happening here is so much ash is going by these pieces at such high temperature, and ash turns silica to glass. Clay is almost entirely silica. So when ash turns the silica to glass, it eventually builds up so much because there's so much ash going by these things that it st starts to melt and drip off. And because there's a kind of uh, line of least resistance, there's areas that tend to have more silica and less grog, and they tend to uh, be more amenable to erosion, then you start to get these grooves, and then the, the uh, dripping of the glass reinforces those grooves. So you get that. The other thing that you can see, here's the erosion, and these, these gouges here are caused by erosion, and all the work around the lip just eaten away. But the other thing you've got is this angled, um, the angled embers. The reason that embers stick like that and become hard like conge is because the ash that is causing the erosion, the ash that comes and turns the silica to glass, then that glass runs down the side of the piece and there's a bed of embers surrounding the piece and that glass inundates the embers touching the pot and then turns them, saturates them with glass and sticks them to the side and that becomes a very desirable effect. Konge, again, konge in Japanese is the term referring to the, um, the rice that burns and sticks to the bottom of your rice pot. And then this here is something that is very unique to the, um, to the dancing, to this uh, Saskine kiln, in that um, it has this pile of embers that build up under the firebox and they slope outward. And so this is the sign of that angle, that slope. Um, the more in the firebox it is, the higher that angle is. And as you get out into, this might have been into the actual, um, to see the fire, the fire flue, you get a more of a sharper angle. We can look at another example of this.
kind of effect here you can see a fantastic effect of erosion definitely this hole these edges are now razor sharp and it's just been eaten away the other thing that's going on is that these gouges in this rough edge is all eaten away by uh, the conge I'm sorry, no, by the ash, uh, the ash process. That's all erosion. And here you can see that angled. And this one was in the firebox uh, just before the flues. You can see that by the high angle there. And that, again, that angle is the slope of the embers, the natural slope that occurs. So now we're getting to the fire passage. This is the uh, flue, the passage between the firebox and the um, wear chamber. And you can see that the angle of the ash is... Uh, much uh, lower and you can see some signs of erosion but it's much less as you get further from the fire uh, the source of the fuel you you reduce that impact anything above the ash the ember line gets heavily uh, saturated with with ash and gets turns very glassy and colorful anything below begins to get insulated and um, becomes um, almost um, becomes, can be as, as lower temperature because it's so insulated and can be even bisque, but this is not the case in this piece. Here's another view of the piece. So now we're on to D, which is on the floor of the, um, on the floor of the kiln inside the wear chamber, but in that zone that we can't load anything on top of. And I have a tradition in our, our kiln um, the Rosinante, to put something taller against a back wall. You're not supposed to go too tall but in that zone, but I, um, I, that zone in the Rosinante is pretty wide, and I can, the very back I can put a, this is about a 16, 18 inch tall piece here. Uh, and then this, um, you can see the very low line of ember. This was inside the chamber, very close to the, um, to the flue, um, but just inside, and you can see this kind of lighter colored area where the, the embers kind of piled out, sloped down, and, and insulated that area. And here's a classic example of, uh, now this is, usually you don't have a tea bowl in this zone, but I did uh, do that. This was fired in uh, Miharu, Japan, in the first Sasuke kiln to be built. And um, you can actually see that ember slope. This was on the floor uh, in the zone, in the D zone, the, the floor just inside the, the wear chamber. So then E is, uh, is the shelves, um, the lower part of the shelves. And this is an example of what you can get uh, with heavy ash impingement, um, but, but no, no contact with the conge. With the, it's not, the wood isn't actually touching it, but you get lots of ash. This is an unrelated effect, but that's, those white spots are caused by uh, decomposed granite or feldspar um, wedged into the clay, and at these temperatures that becomes a liquid glaze, glazy material and starts to melt out and form these spots with halos around them. The green is the uh, wood ash. And inside this piece, if you look, you can see this zone, I, I've tipped it up so you can see that was the, the part that was facing, that was flat on the shelf, and that is a pool of green glass uh, called a yudamari, uh, an ash pool. And here's another piece from those shelves. So F, um, you get a very nice quality of ash, and it's a great position uh, for both natural ash glazing and for um, some mingling with, uh, with uh, applied glazes like Shino's and Oribe's. And here's an example of a piece that was fired right on the outer edge on the top of uh, F, right on the top of the um, first stack of shelves. And this pot, you can see at the bottom, was fired um, on the top of the shelves as well. Okay, so next to the bag wall is the G zone. We looked at that. And that's where things are going to be cooler. You're going to get more hero or more um, flame marking uh, and less of the shinzenyu, less of the uh, glaze, uh, of the natural ash glaze. So you can use this, you can put glaze in this area. It's a very nice area for glaze or glazed pieces, or you can uh, take your chances with bare clay, as I did with this piece. 
Here's an example of a glazed piece from that area. And here, this is, um, this is a piece that was fired uh, on the top of the shelf um, in the uh, F, probably in the F or G zone. H is the top of the back shelves. And you're getting lots of ash still, but you can also start mingling it with, uh, with glaze. With, um, you can put applied glaze on the piece. And here you can see those marks are actually from a scallop shell. And not to go into it too much, but a scallop shell will leave part of its, its surface on the pot. It's a release agent you can actually uh, put your, um, you can put scallop shells against the side of a piece and scallop shells are almost entirely calcium with just a touch of sodium and the calcium is a flexing agent that will melt silica but only if it's in contact with it so the top of the silica shell gets uh, glassy and sticks to the piece but everything else just turns to powder the, the, the middle and, and out, inside of the, of the shell just turns to powder I is the side stoking area, and the side stoking area uh, will, um, you can put things on the floor, but you want to wad them so that they don't um, get knocked around too much um, because they're going to get wood thrown directly on them. So they tend to get covered with embers um, fairly quickly. They don't have much ash to begin with because of the wood, um, because of the bag wall blocking the ash from the, the fire. And then, um, but it has a little bit of ash through the gaps of the bag wall. And then um, it gets covered with wood. And what I find is that if there's going to be any color on them at all, it'll be on the part that's facing down towards the floor. Everything else gets a very kind of um, dark, smoky effect from carbon trapping. And next to that is the, uh, there's a shelf, there's some shelves in the last stack, and those tend to um, give you um, some evidence of ember contact. And it's a cooler, lighter touch of natural ash. And in the very back of the shelf stack is an excellent place for, the, the last shelf stack on the back against the back wall is a great place for the Oni Temaku. Temaku in a gas kiln is black with uh, going brown at the edges where it gets thin. But in, in a wood kiln, you get these wonderful um, gold hues. And sometimes that gold hue will be like this in a rabbit fur, kind of looking like it's almost raining down. And sometimes it'll get spotted and crystally. Here's a great example of the rabbit fur, that beautiful linear quality. Here's another example of Oni Temaku, and you can see it going from the blush of gold to a deep, rich black. It's a very nice effect there, a very fine effect. So then the flue between the wear chamber and the chimney, uh, thats we call that sometimes the secret chamber, and um, so I've gotten really beautiful little pieces with uh, Shino and with some other uh, and also in natural ash, it can be quite wonderful because everything goes through there. You cannot choke it up. You have to make sure you don't overload it. It has to be small pieces. Um, and it's sometimes referred to as a secret, secret chamber. So um, since the results vary widely, it's a risky place to put things. It's chancy. But often things are wonderful. But they're secret, so no pictures for this one. Um, and then the last is the, uh, the chimney chamber, which is going to be very light coating of ash, mostly the gaseous uh, in, you know, passage of the chemicals, calcium, uh, potassium, and sodium that have vaporized will leave just very light traces of their passage. And that pretty much concludes the, the talk on loading, thinking about how to load and how, where things go and what kinds of effects you can get. And I always try to sneak in a picture of my daughter in some, some stage of her life. Here she's helping us fire up the pizza oven on top of the dancing fire wood kiln. And um, so, um, and, and she's a reminder that we get so involved. This is so much work and it's such a passion. And it's all to augment a life which is wonderful. And that's what my daughter reminds me of daily.